And we are back with another edition of How About Them Celtics Talk and Sees with Bobby Kravitsky of SI Media Group. Bobby, how are you doing today? Doing fantastic. Enjoying a combination of a huge stretch of Celtics games and playoff football. So it's a nice one-two punch for sure. It's been fun. It's been fun. Uh, a few weeks ago, I went to the Celtics Chiefs game, and me, my brother, and my Celtics cousin. Chiefs. Uh, sorry, <laughs> it's got the Celtics on the That's mind. That's how Pats you know the man game. is committed, people. I know, I know. I went to the Pats Chiefs game, and before the game, my brother and my cousin and I were talking about like who do you think won the Super Bowl, and they were like, "Oh, the Cowboys are gonna make a run." I said, "Guys, the Cowboys stink," and they're like, "You're an idiot." You and I texted them today. I said, "What?" Like what? What do you want to say now? Like I they told you, the Cowboys fall think. on their face. Never they, oh, trust like, the Cowboys. I, I, there's I nothing I would rather bet on. A little bit. I little don't. Bit. I don't. I know the fan ball. base is insufferable. They're the Knicks fans of football. No, they're but... the Lakers fans of football. Sam, Lakers, that, Cowboys, fair. Fair, Yankees, fair, fair, fair. and the Yankees. And I'll yes, <laughs> exactly. But exactly, <laughs> I I like half feel bad because it's like kind of cruel. Nah. Nah, At least they it, got like whomped instead of there being like, oh, like this hope. looks good. And then it just doesn't go well. It's also they so stink. much about Jerry Jones and like the schadenfreude of seeing him lose. So mm. it, it's the whole Cowboys package. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just I love it. I, there, there's nothing you can bank on more than the Cowboys choking in the playoffs. It is it is a lock. Yeah, it, 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 it will always be in gut wrenching fashion, and yep. usually that means like Tony Romo dropping the snap or something like that. <laughs> but of course, this time around against the Packers at home, where the Cowboys were just steamrolling most of their opponents, of course, what it is, they get crushed. Like that's their version of what could be the most gut wrenching way for them to torment their fan base yesterday, and that was it. Speaking it's hilarious. Of- Places being a fortress, the garden it would be heartbreaking <laughs> to see playoff Food games transition. Go there. Celtics, you know now. Celtics won their 19th game at the garden on Saturday night. This is true. Uh, they're gonna be going for 20 later this week, but 19 right now took down the Rockets. Uh, up and Shangun played well early on, and after that, the Celtics just said no, and, and nobody Great else question. in the Rockets was really effective at all. Yeah, what's up? Where would you? What like top what is Shangun in terms of big guys? Like top what number? Because mm. I had a conversation on Saturday and it was like he's good, but then like you start thinking about guys, you're like, well, he's not better than like not better than Jokic and Bead, uh, Bam, Wemby was tossed out there. Would Kat. you put Giannis in this conversation? Giannis is kind of different. I think Giannis is like just, more just of asking a, for you know. I don't know, but like I also would say Anthony Davis is in the conversation. Yeah, definitely. Like seven? seven. Seven? Top seven. Does that sound right? Would you put Maybe him ahead eight? of Sabonis? Uh, no. Agreed. Jokic, Embiid, Sabonis, Bam. No order in particular. What uh, about Chet? Chet was another one that I think might be better. Davis, Chet. Anthony, and I, think, I think Chet's better, and I feel yeah. more comfortable with him Cat? in a playoff game than Shangun. Yeah, maybe Cat. I think him and Shangun are about on par. Although Cat's been really effective this year, but he's playing more of the four. So I think seven or eight. Yeah, around. Okay. Is where I'm just curious. Line. I don't know who else. I, I think like I like him. That's why. Too. I'm a fan of Shangun. Who are we missing? I had to pump the brakes. I'd be willing to put Shangun over Miles Turner, but there's a case yeah. for either one. I think he's so. He's going to be good. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's, 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 he's undoubtedly a, the best player on the Rockets. I don't think he'll make it, but he's a borderline all star this year. I think Shang-Gun. he should. I think he should make it. It's He's tough deserving. though. With the West. I just don't think yeah. he'll get in. It's tough with the Western Conference. I mean, I, um, I think it's fair to yeah. put Gobert over him. Yeah, I can see it with the defense. It makes sense. It, it's just a a tough uh, a tough case. But again, Celtics shut him down. Uh, he was getting buckets on everybody. The Celtics threw at him. Uh, Porzingis guarded him. Didn't work. Cornette didn't work. Drew Holiday was put on him for a little while. Didn't work. Uh, but it didn't matter because nobody else in the Rockets did anything. Uh, Fred Van Fleet had a rough game. Jalen Green couldn't make his shots. Jabari Smith got blocked by Jalen Brown two times. Uh, Cam Whitmore played well, but that wasn't enough. And the Celtics just absolutely steamrolled him, got out in transition. Uh, Jalen Brown shot 11 of 14 for 32 points. Jason Tatum had 29, 26, a lot of points uh, as well for those two. 27, I was close. I was around there. Uh, good game for the Rockets or for the Celtics against the Rockets. Kept the win streak alive, Bobby. Any any major takeaways from that? It was the second blowout in a row, so it's, it's hard to take too too much away from these thirty pointers. Yeah, I think you could see how exhausted the Rockets were coming on the second night of a back to back. A game against Detroit 
that not only came down to the wire, but Jaden Ivey's three for the win in and out to the basketball gods just continue to stick it to the Pistons. But when it comes to, so it's really disappointing that they just didn't seem to have much in the tank. I thought they were really going to get up, try to get a win for Ime in his return to Boston and be physical and swarming defensively. And their double teams were late. They were ineffective. I mean, there's a prime example was when the ball goes to Tatum on the baseline and he spins away from the help and gets a two-handed dunk. And so just Houston defensively, they didn't pose much of a threat, even when they were keeping the Jays quiet. And with Tatum, I thought that was more by choice than by force from the opposition. It was the Southers were consistently creating quality shots. And then on the defensive side of it, you mentioned Shangun goes off for 16 points in the first half and is giving everyone problems. He had three in the third quarter, doesn't play in the fourth. And I thought that Porzingis did an outstanding job handling both how crafty a player Shangun is and his physicality, which gave him some trouble in the first two quarters. And Jack, when it comes to help defenders, your boy Derek White really picked it up a notch in terms of just throwing that second body at Shangun to disrupt him, slow him down. And a prime example was that turnover where Shangun spins, Derek White sees it coming, and he's right there, knocks it free, and eventually it's a loose ball foul on Shangun, Celtics ball. And so they really just, they were all over him in that third quarter. Initial Celtics Rockets takeaways, Derek White is back, first and foremost. Uh, it's excellent to see him playing well again, knocking down his shots after a cold stretch due to the Reddick podcast appearance, as everyone has uh, attributed it to. Um, so he looked very comfortable. He missed his first couple shots, but the threes were really good, three of five. And he finished five of nine, I think. So it was an over 50% game for him. And he was a 29 plus minus in the box score. So very good from Derek White. And another big takeaway, it's sick when Tatum and Brown make all their threes. The Celtics are going to be really hard to stop if that's happening. We haven't seen a whole lot of consistency from those guys in terms of three-point shooting this year. Tatum has been on a major ascension as of January. I know he was asked about that after the game, but to see Jalen be that efficient was great. He was on the attack. He was smart with his shots. He came out once again and kick-started the offense with 11 quick points, I want to say. And by the time Tatum had finished his second quarter onslaught, Brown had only taken five shots, but he was still able to make his presence known. Not to mention Porzingis being a monster early on, too. So it was really just an example of everybody firing on all cylinders. But you can see the difference between Saturday's game and Thursday's game, where when Jalen doesn't have it early, the Celtics seem to struggle. He has just been absolute nails in the first quarter of almost every game. And when he doesn't have it, they should have some sort of backup plan. Just a weird thought. I don't know how much sense it actually makes, but yes. I think they're just, they use the first quarter to get him going. That's how he's always done. Like he's always loved the Celtics in first quarter yes. shots the past few years. Like that's just kind of been the game plan. I don't know. Like if having a backup plan is necessarily as important as maybe just not letting Milwaukee hit a million threes on your face. Uh, I think that was probably <laughs> just as bad uh, as like, yeah, yeah, maybe we should stop the Milwaukee from scoring. Um, but I, I do think there is a truth to at some point you got to acknowledge that he doesn't have it. Cause I mean, you've seen over the years, like one of the biggest complaints with Jalen is that he just keeps shooting when he's struggling. And I think he's been a lot better at this year at mixing in um, playmaking uh, as well and, and he's focused a lot in transition which leads to easier looks which is help he leads the league in transition buckets uh, or field goal attempts Shea hasn't beaten points but he's second in points too um, but he's getting out in transition and transition frequency he's up there with like, like like he's treating transition like he's a role player that only gets out in transition like he's on par with Obi Toppin KJ Martin and like Josh Hart like like he is getting a lot of his offense in transition it, well, it's because the uh, the Celtics offense has so many stars that like he can only get his buckets in certain ways, and so he's so focused on getting his buckets uh, in transition or, or or on the fast break. Like that's such an important part of the Celtics offense, and he is taking it upon himself to lead it. And now, because he's doing it so often, he's on par with the stars who are like 
on, like paid to just run in transition and get buckets. Uh, so it's kind of funny to look at it that way. But uh, in addition to just the win over the Rockets on Saturday, getting back on track, Ime Odoka made his return to Boston, spoke to the media before the game, uh, dropped some interesting quotes, talked about the relationship he still has with the players, his biggest regret being letting people down and not winning the title in 2022. And also that uh, when asked about that odd period where the players were complaining, they didn't know anything. He said they lied, said they knew who needs to know knew, which was just a very weird thing. And then Jalen after the game sort of explained, yeah, we knew something, but then there was like internal speculation. There was more and then it wasn't, it was just a very odd evening in terms of the back and forth between Udoka talking and saying that versus what Jalen said after the game, Bobby, any thought, any thoughts from Udoka's return to the garden? Well, as far as they lied, and that's one, I mean, I think a lot of his comments are getting considerable attention, which we expected, but that one really stuck out. And I don't know why he decided to air some of his guys out like that. Tatum, when he got asked about it post game, seemed caught off guard. Like, let me take a second to figure out how I want to respond to this. And I think Jalen Brown kind of cleared Ime's name, at least in the minds of some of the people who will see his comments on saying, that yeah, like Ime told us the deal, and then there was speculation of okay, this was more than what we were hearing, but it turns out that wasn't true. So if you're Ime, you certainly appreciate that from Jalen. If you're Jalen and Jason and anyone else that he's referring to there, and you can figure out what names they are, you have every right internally at least to be like, what the bleep? Like what wh- what was that, Ime? Why why do you feel so compelled to say? You know, to air out the truth there, what seemed like it was clearly going to be kept private on the players' part, when they're publicly saying, we were kept in the dark, we still don't know what happened, there's no closure here. When they were saying all these comments last season, Ime completely flips it. So it's just, it, it was really interesting, and that got everyone's antenna up as soon as he said it. I'm curious what you guys think of this. Does the Jalen response make you question the information that we have? Because he said... Like, what What do you think the information that they weren't sure was true and then it was proven false is? Well, because we, we heard a bunch of stuff, I guess. I don't know. This might be bad to speculate, but we heard a bunch of stuff and then more kept coming. Like, where does the line get drawn? I think that's a good question. Jack, you go ahead. You look like you're about to answer. Well, I just I just don't know. Like, it's impossible to speculate. Like, you don't there is no real like place to even start. I don't want to throw around like accusations or anything. What we know is that there was a relationship that was I, consensual at the start, I, I think. And then it wasn't. And Ime was being creepy and weird towards the person once it ended. And that's where the investigation had to happen. And past that, everything was kept under wraps. All I know is that I don't think Brad Stevens would have been crying during a press conference if Ime did everything by the books and like a good person. That that's that's the reason that I stand and stay here saying like I don't support the people who said he did nothing wrong. Clearly, he did something wrong and the reports that, you know, he it was all good, all kosher was because Shams and Woj were so, you know, we need to get the story out quickly, quickly, get everything like it, it was handled poorly. Afterwards, after the fact, they doubled back and said, no, there was some, you know, weird stuff that happened after the fact. I don't know what the extra like reporting internally happened, you know, that was told to the players that had them concerned. But what I know is Ime made poor decisions that got him booted from the Celtics organization that the the Celtics organization felt strongly enough, you know, went against their values and, and and you know, went against the people that worked for them that he had to go. And I trust their decision-making on that. And he did it to himself. Like that, that's the only like speculation or thought process I can have. I have no idea what else they would have like had internally happen. Exactly. That One, I don't want to start a dialogue with listeners of this show who then turn around to their friends and are saying, okay, where do we, you know, what do we think happened here? Right. I don't want to, you know, reignite that conversation because we saw what happened initially because of how irresponsible the coverage of it was. And then secondly, as Jack was bringing up there, and that's my main point, they had just gone to the finals with the head coach that Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown in particular hand picked for them. They didn't want to move on from this guy. Okay. They clearly felt like their hand was forced and they had to. So again, we don't know what happened, 
but it's pretty safe to say that lines were crossed and he, and ultimately the organization, they felt compelled and like their hands were tied that we don't want to make this decision, but we really have no choice here. I think the conclusion is, and, and this is pretty good, you know, chat is this doesn't happen if it's not for Ime. Like bottom line, you can say what you want, but if he doesn't lose self-control, it doesn't matter. Like it's his fault. That's what it has to be. And I think that's why this is all productive to talk about. But I mean, I'm happy that we don't have to talk about it after today because I'm kind of sick of him. I, I have completely soured on Ime in the course of four days. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if you're going to go to that last point right there, I'm curious to get both of your takes. I think there is a very legitimate case that the Celtics are better off with Joe Mazzulla taking the baton. That I, I do think Ime, strictly talking about on court and understanding you know, the proper weight on that and putting it in perspective of the grand scheme of everything outside of it, but looking at the on-court impact, I think Ime came along at the right time to help Jalen and Jason with their growth mentally, but that he was more of a defensive-minded coach. And I think Joe Mazzulla right now, in terms of his ability to communicate about certain matters and leaning more towards the offense with how the game is played today and what the rules are, I think that Joe Mazzulla, there's a very legitimate case that he is – better for this team now and in the long run than if it was just Ime continuously. You or me? You go start ahead. With, start with Jack because I feel like we went me, Sam, me. So we'll go back to Jack. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, go ahead, Jack. I, I do think, and I've talked about this with Sam a lot, I, I think there is a truth to Joe Mazzulla as a player's coach. We, we I talked about it. We talked about it when Eric Spolster signed the extension. Like, there are there is a lot of value to coaches like Eric Spolster and Ty Lue who are very drop this play, get this done, do this, do this, do this. I, I mean, I forget who it was. I think it was Joe or maybe it was Jalen who was talking about it after the game. He was like, we had Brad for a while, then we got the nice mix up with Emi Odoka, but then Joe was a mix of both of them where Brad was telling us everything to do on the court and Emi was go figure it out. And I, I think Joe is very much – he's great at understanding what his players need to find the best success. He's understanding what they need on and off the court. He's very in tune with that. He, he is a, a Steve Kerr S coach. Who's also willing to call some of these plays and also not that Steve Kerr isn't, but you know what I'm saying? Like he's never going to be Eric Spolster. Tell them to do everything. Ty Lue, like making a million adjustments during the game. He'll make his adjustments when he needs to. He'll call the plays when he needs to, but for the most part, he is doing what he can do to put his players in the best position to, su to succeed. And now that the Celtics have had that experience with Brad, had that one year with Ime, I do think this is probably the most valuable type of coach that they could have moving forward. So I agree with you, Jack. I think in particular, Joe is the perfect coach for this group. He has gotten all of these star level players to buy into probably smaller roles than they've ever had. I mean, Drew Holiday is the perfect example. His maturity as a player shows every day because he's down five shots from last year and he's taking roughly around the same amount of shots he took as a rookie for Philadelphia. The rest of the guys, Porzingis, Tatum Brown, Derek White, even Al Horford coming off the bench, have made some sort of sacrifice. You're seeing Jalen have to focus on transition more, Jack, like you said, where he's not necessarily going to get as many opportunities other, way, other places but he knows that he can excel in that particular area. And so I think Joe has done a great job at getting all of these guys to buy in, galvanizing them, instilling team values within the group, and I think that rules. As far as Ime goes, and maybe last year's team, maybe Ime was the coach for that group because specifically through the finals run, that was a group with Tatum, Brown, and mostly role players. You could make the argument for other guys being slightly above that, but somebody like Marcus was out there to defend and facilitate. Al Horford's there for defense. Rob was a lob, threat, shot-blocking, athletic guy. And then you have the rest of the bunch. Last year, still a lot of that. Team was better. Derek White was coming into his own. Brogdon was a great piece off the bench as a sixth man. But you still had a lot more guys that were looking for more pieces of the pie rather than looking to sacrifice. And I think with Ime, he helps keep them in check. 
where when you have the right group of guys and they deserve the credit too for being willing to make the sacrifice, Joe is a great guy to push them in the right direction. But I think Ime is more of a, hey, everybody, let's lock in. And Joe is more of like a, hey, everybody, here's the goal. Yeah, He's, he's I less think, forceful. Sorry about that, Sam. I think that no, no, no. Ime was a toughen them up while empowering them coach. And I think that's something, that's his fastball, right? Like we're seeing him do this in Houston now. And I think that he, when he talked about pregame, you know, I didn't get the chance to build and to grow myself with them. I'm not sure that he had a plan in place and probably spent a good chunk of the offseason before what transpired and led to his ousting. I think he was probably trying to figure out, okay, well, now I need my off-speed pitch. Now I need to figure out how to, once I've gotten this group to the plateau we're on, coming off the finals run, how do I get them to take the next step while figuring out how to do it myself? So I do think it's the right point in time to pass the baton to Joe and that I look at it and say, you're also getting someone who has figured out how to win on the margins and adapt. Like I think Joe Missoula is, this is his fastball is exactly where the Celtics have arrived at. Thanks in part to Ime, not the only one, but like Jack said that, you know, they had Brad system, which really taught them how to think the game through. And then Ime said, we're going to make the system about you guys now compared to a specific scheme. And that now you're seeing things like, here's how we're going to win on the margin. We're going to crash the glass more. We're going to adapt to certain changes as the game evolves, right? And we're going to pull influences from soccer and all these different lanes. And I think that's really helped this team. And when it comes to the buy-in, the other side of it is, I think the players deserve a tremendous amount of credit, not just one for doing it, but for in generating it themselves. Jason Tatum calls the players only meeting with the top six before the season. And everyone gets to air out their feelings and walk out of there saying, we're all pulling in one direction. And we see this through the same set of eyes. And so Jalen looks at it and says, yeah, I, I understand offensively that we have so many mouths to feed and it's not going to be the same. I think one of his key areas of growth is what Jack has talked and written about there. And that is he's always been the one who sets the tone for them, pushing the pace and operating up tempo. He wants to do it more than anyone else on the team. He says, I come to the coaching staff and say, that's how I want to play. He's talked about it with certain players, including Tatum. And I think he's grown in that area of doing it both more consistently and more impactfully this season. So to see his growth on that front, to see how his commitment to defense and his, his personal challenges, he wants to get on an all-defensive team, whether or not that happens. But his role in generating stops helps to fuel that type of approach and to get his way offensively. So I love to see the buy-in of the sacrifice that comes from Joe Mazzulla's end, but also the players really taking initiative on that front. Definitely. Definitely. I think, I think Jalen's been the best he's ever been this year. Uh, and I think Tatum, for what it's worth, as much as he struggled with the shot at times, like you can see that he is the most complete player that he's ever been, uh, in my opinion. And, and they needed those steps from those two with all of the new players in town. Uh, and, and they've gotten it so far. Um, speaking of next steps, uh, I asked Joe Mazzula about Sam Hauser's defense uh, on, what is it, Saturday night now? Yeah, and he I, he kind of did a, a throwback. So November thirteenth, way at the start of the season, I think it was Justin Turpin of WEI. Shout out Justin, who asked him about the defense, and Joe was like, uh, "He's better defense than people give him credit for." I can't say why, or I'll get in trouble. Uh, and I asked him again Saturday, and he said, "It's because he's white." Yeah, I said, <laughs> he "said he's a white shooter that people don't think can defend." Uh, and Sam houser has been really good on defense this year, and it's not the like. It's gotten past the point of, yeah, he's a pretty good defender for who he is. He is just a legitimately solid defensive player. Like, he is stopping guys in one-on-one -on -one situations. He's providing good help defense at the rim. Like, he's staying in front of people. He's not fouling. Like, he he's just a good defender. And it, it's gone past the point of, like, oh, well, he can stay with guys for a shooter. Like, no, he's, like, he's legitimately good. The Rockets went at him, I think, three different times uh, in isolation the other night. Dylan Brooks... Uh, tried a little step back. It was the first play uh, the Rockets ran after he checked into the game. They just said, yeah, Dylan, go get a bucket. And then Sam Hauser 
you know, got in front of him, didn't let him score. Uh, Jabari Smith went at him later in the first half. Um, and it was a turnover and the Celtics coaches were up on the bench, hyping him up when he was, uh, defending him. And then Cam Whitmore went at him at the end of the half, I think, and nothing. So like, like he's done a really good job at staying in front of guys this year. And it's been impressive to watch. And I mean, Joe's comments were pretty hilarious. (laughs) Yeah. I I think that last season there were two truths. One is there were so many instances of players getting out of pocket and they wanted to undress Sam Hauser and get the highlight that was going to go viral. And so that was detrimental to them. Huge advantage to Hauser and the Celtics. It also didn't show us. It masked how where he was actually at, at least as a one-on-one defender. And then he's had more time, of course, to grow in that area, to get even stronger. He moves his feet well, which, again, for reasons that are known, people probably don't expect. And so this season, what you're seeing is someone who has leveled up defensively And so even though players have caught on for the most part and say, okay, I'm not going to try and do the slip and slide and all these and one street tape moves and then jack a mid-range fadeaway jumper over this guy, he's still locking them down. Guys, sometimes no nonsense, line drive to the basket, and he stays in front of them. He chests them with the, you know, walls them off on the drive, and they ultimately end up with a low-quality shot that doesn't go in. Sometimes it leads to turnovers. So credit to Sam Hauser because – Right now, he is a legitimate seventh man who could be that role in any rotation. And he, because of that shooting, he can elevate. And by the way, we're also seeing his growth in small snippets of what he can do, getting more comfortable, putting the ball on the deck and making plays. So he's evolving to someone who could at least one day, maybe as early as next season, be the sixth man on a team. He just continues to climb up the hierarchy. Yeah, I, I think... His ability to play defense has probably gotten better this year. It was solid last year. But he was not a playoff player last year. That's partly because I don't think Joe trusted him, just because he was a newer guy. This year, he has essentially replaced Grant Williams. Not in the sense that he can guard big bodies, but he is a very able defender. And he's still knocking down threes at a crazy clip. So he's replaced what they got out of Grant Williams last year. And that's huge because the loss of Grant Williams was something that we had to talk about over the summer. At the time, we did not think it was as big of a deal because there was Porzingis, there was Al Horford, and there was Rob Williams. But Rob Williams is no longer. And now there's a little bit room where you could be like, Grant could still help on this team. But where is minutes going to come? If he is still on this roster... You really can't pick out a spot where you would like love Grant Williams over any of the guys. Like, would you really rather have him out there than Sam Hauser? I think Hauser moves better off the ball than Grant Williams does to to get himself open shots and things like that. So I'm very proud of him in that sense. And I think that just makes the Celtics so much deeper in, in a much more difficult team to pick apart. And he's almost like a decoy because, like you said, guys really want to go at him. So just just really good growth from Sam Hauser. I think that's great. Not to mention his contract is excellent. And to your playoffs point, Joe said specifically like, yeah, keep sending guys at him. It'll help him prepare for the playoffs. So it does yeah. sound like the plan is to run him into playoffs a bit more this season. But also hey, he's the seventh guy in the rotation. He is. He's mm-hmm. out there. He's going to be there Meant in the to say season. It. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Jack for getting that viral quote. <laughs> Legion who put it out Props there. To I, was our like, boy. I was like, my man, Jack made him say that. Good job, Jack. Had to. I had to. All right. Cover all the topics. Time for trivia. Now, I have six different cards that are all relatively like, yeah, you can get this. And then I have one card that I think you would get maybe one name on. So do you want the obscenely hard card or do you want one of the, eh, yeah, you'll probably be fine cards. <laughs> Let's do the Raptors first. Yeah. The Raptors? Gonna... Oh, I yeah. I we forgot about the Raptors. Quick, quick. Can That's it. all right. <laughs> I, I forgot about the Raptors. Like, That's when why. you come back to, hey, is there anything else like that we missed? And I just make like a footnote about the Raptors. My bad. Celtics play the Raptors tonight as we're recording this. Um, They have not lost to them all season, right? They, they, are, they uh, have not lost the Raptors. Raptors in a while. They <clears throat> when is the last time the Celtics year? lost to the Raptors? I think Take they're 2-0 and against them this year. 3-0. and I 3-0. and Are they due? scary stuff it's it's like it's how i feel about playing philly in the playoffs like last year i really thought they were due for the loss and it didn't happen this year i feel better but jalen brown questionable tonight yeah jalen questionable 
they're in the north. Will Drizzy be there to make fun of Peyton Pritchard again? <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? I need a photo with those two before the game. March 28th, 2022 is the last time the Celtics lost to the Raptors. Yeah, it's been a while. Where was the Almost. game? It was in Toronto, I believe. It was a three-point loss. So it was a close loss. Um, and did everybody play for the Celtics? There was no Tatum or Brown. Oh, that was the game that uh, nobody played. That was, it a was the game. game. It, it was, yeah, Pritchard had, well, 10 points. Marcus had 28 and 10. Uh, it was Marcus, Derek White, Grant Williams, Aaron Neesmith, Daniel Tice getting the start. So, yeah. Little tidbit about the Raptors. I feel like Pritchard always plays well up there. Anytime they go up to Toronto, I feel like he at least gets double digits. I don't know what it is about it. It seems like he just kind of has like a hot game anytime he gets to, to play in front of the Canadian fans. Is that a fact or fiction? We're running with it as a fact. He averages 10 against the Raptors. So. Yeah. Something to monitor tonight. There you go. Does Crypto yeah. P go off? <laughs> Uh, Bobby, any thoughts for tonight against the Raptors, though? I don't know the Raptors injury report, like you mentioned. Jalen is questionable. Um, I'll double check here quickly if the Raptors have anybody out or questionable for the game. It looks like Yaka Pertle is going to be out. Sorry, Sam. Uh, and then that Otto Porter right. and Christian no Loco also out. But Jakob's the only one in part of the rotation, and they're running with Jonte Porter lately. So that's that's yeah. First off, I, Thoughts. I like me some John T. Porter, by the way, especially on the defensive side. Just say, um, yeah, Pirtle, by the way, the Celtics have roasted him defensively when he's on the floor. They put him in the pick and roll. Go ahead, Sam. We've roasted him. We had like our one of our favorite videos is us making fun of. We did a film breakdown. I think it was of Jalen and Porzingis doing like crazy stuff against the Raptors. And we were like, wait a minute. He's getting cooked literally every time. Like, look how lost he is defensively. So Bobby is on the head with that one. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, at their first matchup this season, I even asked Jay, I asked Jalen Kristaps and Joe about that. And they talked about how Toronto, they switched up their coverages. And Missoula was pretty gleeful about it in discussing it after the win. And just, I mean, he, he was lunch meat out there. He's just not quick enough. To trade for him at that time was suspect. To not admit defeat and then sign, re-sign him in the over the summer was perplexing. But we've seen that Masai can be quite stubborn, so not surprising perhaps. The Raptors, since the trade though with OG, they were playing well, but now they're on a bit of a losing streak. Uh, the last I checked, it was they'd lost their three games in a row and four. I think they were four and six in their last ten. The, the last time I monitored it. So I thought that they got off to a good start with RJ Barrett and with quickly, but even if you disregard what happened in the Lakers game, and that's one of the most epic coaching rants I've ever seen. So $25,000 fine money well spent, mm -hmm. but overall it, it's the first time the Celtics will go up against the Toronto group that, you know, since the trade, they look a little bit different and they probably match up better against the Celtics than they did previously, especially with Pirtle off the floor. Yeah, I'm excited to see the new look Raptors too. In in particular, we've seen quickly give the Celtics a hard time a few different times uh, when he was with the Knicks. RJ Barrett is another great piece for them to add just with what they're trying to build. Like I think they set themselves up for an interesting future at the very least. Like They should have some hope. They are headed on a better trajectory now than they were before the trade. So that's all pretty exciting. Um, but I still think the Celtics will win because that's just what they do. But they haven't beat this Raptors group. So you, who, how can you say? Muted. Muted. I am muted. I said you never know, but RJ has been a lot better since he's been in Toronto. He had a couple of rough games, but he was hot when he first got there. Quickly, he's been good, too. It just seems like this team needed a bit more uh, dynamicism, as as vague as that is. Like, they were very... Well done to just smoothly pronounce that word. Up a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, he, like, stumbled through, like, a regular phrase in, in your outfit. Yeah, you, you said able... You said able, but you pronounced it as capable. You said able I remember. I was laughing Did at I? it. Did <laughs> I? <Yeah. laughs> um... <laughs> No, this Raptor team is is different. Uh, I still think they need to trade Siakam and shake it up even more and just roll with RJ, Scotty, and quickly because I do think they have something there with those three. It's just a matter of what can you put around them, how much can you help develop Scotty moving forward, uh, and what can quickly become as a full-time starter. So 
at the very least, the Raptors have gone from what the hell are you doing to I can kind of see it, which is a step in the right direction w. for yeah. Toronto. They're going the right way, which is good. But Celtics take them on tonight as you guys are listening to this. Uh, and now, Bobby, did I forget anything? Are we good now? We're did ready for trivia. You're good. Awesome. So, again, I ask, would you like a normal possible one or the impossible card? I got to be honest, Sam. I want the impossible one. <laughs> Me too. No, we're on the Let's same page. We're on it. I am so unbelievably happy I could bait you into picking the impossible card because when I said impossible card, I think you guys are going to get uh, very frustrated very quick. So the question, through the 2021-22 season, seven seven-footers have played more than 100 games for the Celtics. Can you name them? And now you might be thinking, wait, this is going to be easy. No. <laughs> seven seven-footers have played at least 100 games for the Celtics through the 2021-22 season. And I need you to tell me there. Bobby's first, I think. Thank you. Robert Parrish? Yes, that is one of them. There's a couple easy ones, but it, uh, did they spell it wrong on the card? Am I, I think yeah, it's okay. one R, right? Yeah, it, it is. It's two on the card. So I questioned myself, but they spelled it wrong. That is, that is bad. Okay. Bobby got it. Yes. Bill I Walton. Believe, I believe Bobby took it last time. Uh, no, not Bill Walton. No. Yeah, it's two to two in the series. But if you look at the aggregate score, it's still a lot to a little. <laughs> yes. All right, Bobby, back to you. You got Bill Walton on there? No, no, Bill Walton. No, no, so uh, I'm saying Sam just got Bill Walton. No, I was wrong. Oh, he's not seven. That's See? garbage. This is That's this garbage. Is, this will be fun. Bill Walton was definitely seven feet. By the way, hey. there's, there's someone else who they're not going to have on there that we all know is seven feet, but he's obviously not going to be on the list. KG. Yep, that would be his name. And 6'11", Bill Walton. Hey. My, mine right now. Through 2021-22, I'm still mm. going to go with Luke Cornett. No. Oh! Sorry. No Luke Cornett. He is, uh, at the time, he has now played 125 games for the Celtics, but 26 of them have been this year, and 69 of them were last year. So this is through 21-22, so he had only played like 40 games. Yeah. I may get my feelings hurt here. <clears throat> Oh, wait, hold on. There was a games requirement. Like they only played, they had to play. X I've played of more than 100 games. Yeah. For this. I missed that. That's my bad. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. I'll yes. be better next time. So, Kelly Olenek. No, I, I, I believe he is 6'11. Uh, 6'11. I think he's 6'10, yeah. but he might get listed at 6'11. 6'11. Let's do it. This is why I said you guys are going to get mad because there are. Yeah. Keep going. <laughs> Greg Steamsma. No. Oh, <laughs> oh Sam, man. this is a catastrophe. I, 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 I told you this was. Is Dino awesome. Raj just seven feet? That's a good guess. No, he's not. Uh, I'm okay. so sorry. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Back to you, Bobby. <laughs> good luck, man. <laughs> I got nothing for you. I don't I'll start dishing out clues. How many? How many of these names do you know who they are, Jack? You ready? I got one. Yeah. Well, maybe the game's requirement might take him off the list, but I'm still gonna guess it. Mm -hmm. Rest in peace, Eric Montrose. Yes. Oh my god. Correct. Good one. That was one of the names I recognize, but like don't actually know. Everything this else, I, I recognize two other names on this list and i know one of the names what's the and total two i don't know there's seven so there's five more i recognize two no one and then two of the other ones i'm like eh. i don't know ah uh, no i know one and then the one i just yeah it's very iffy this i said it's impossible for reasons how many total <laughs> names uh five more you guys have two there's seven total <laughs> names. so tony yes. Petit, seven feet tall no he's not <laughs> This is how I feel when we do trivia, Sam. How do you like it? Michael okay. Ola Candy. This, this is how we get better. No Ola Candy. Sorry, oh, that's Bobby. trash. Uh, <laughs> I thought he was on there. Jack knows one of the names. Yes. You should. You guys should get one of the names. Okay. For sure. Mm -hmm. Perk wasn't Let's seven see. feet. Uh, <clears throat> I feel bad. I'm, I'm really stalling here. I'm not doing it on purpose. I just, I have nowhere to go. Mm. It's all good. Oh. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, I, I'm gonna have to. I'm a pass. No, I I'm a pass. I can't. Damn. I can't hold it up anymore. I'll keep Ugly. thinking, but I. Bobby. I had one, but he didn't play a hundred games, unfortunately. But um, Greg Kite. No, no, Greg oh, Kite. What? Wow. He Greg Why not Kite hundred or maybe. Let's maybe see. Not. Let's take a I look. I'll a do some player. research on cat on Greg Kite while Sam continues to think. Greg Kite. Uh, played he was listed at 611 gotcha <clears throat> so yeah all right sam after your guess here or pass here i will give a clue because bobby did start the guessing so okay uh, yeah let's see what we got uh yeah for what it's worth all of these players are listed i believe at exactly seven feet not that that would help too much but there's no like seven two you know what i'm saying they're all exactly this seven feet tall catastrophe. <laughs> I'm bringing great shame to myself. <laughs> oh, man. We've never seen Ken Jennings struggle like this. No, this is bad. I'm going to pass again. I got nothing. All right. So two of them have won championships with the Celtics. One is a two-time champion with the Celtics. Um, for eras, we're looking at this guy played a season and a half in the 90s. This guy played early 70s. This guy was mid sixties. Uh, this guy was early two thousands, and then the other guy was uh, early Brad Stevens era. That's the guy you should get. Mark <clears throat> so Blount. Yes, Mark Blount is correct. Um, that was another one of the guys that I recognize the name, but I didn't exactly know who he is. Uh, <clears throat> Sam, all you. Tyler Zeller. Yes. Oh, yes. That is, We're that back. I, that's the one I was expecting one of you to get, uh, at least. <laughs> there it is. Damned. Big time. All right, Bobby, back to you. This is where it gets tough. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> this is where it gets ropes. <laughs> uh, I will say, you guys have not gotten any of the champs that I mentioned. There is still a two time champion and a one. I thought champion. Tyler Zeller had one. <laughs> There's uh, a two-time champion and a one-time champion. Yep, yeah, one-time champion was in the 70s, two-time champ won it in the 60s. Okay, so this mm. is unfortunate. I believe that I met the one from the 60s, but for the life of me, I cannot remember his <laughs> name. <laughs> but we met someone when I was a kid who was outrageously tall preposterously tall and my dad was telling me about him and he was a backup center on the celtics around that time mm -hmm. the name is that, not that, coming tracks. back what i said that tracks that's probably who this is yeah yeah but i i don't tough you ready if i give you just the last name can we yeah. count it sam, sam does, it, does that work what for you I, or do you want to say I, no I, you're setting a precedent. If I give just the last name, Sam, does it count or not? Sure. Okay. I might even have the first name, but just to seal it, yeah, yeah, last yeah. name Finkel. I think his first name is Hank. Yes, Hank Finkel is correct. Let's wow. Go. <laughs> that was the one I will say that was the champ, the one time champ from the 70s, though. So yes. That that is one I never thought either of you would get because I I I wow. mean I just don't know. I wouldn't have if I didn't meet him, and I didn't think the name was going to come back to me. <clears throat> yeah, I mean he played nine NBA seasons from '66 to '75, and his best year was averaging 11 points, and he averaged four with the Celtics. So that is incredible. Yeah, good good for you. That's nuts. Sam, back to you. You've got a I think Sam is pissed. <laughs> <laughs> I just have nothing. Like I don't, I don't even like. like I don't even have thoughts going through my head. I've got nothing. <laughs> this is uh, how Patriots fans feel. Let's see. I don't know what clue I could, I could give this is, person. Also, I, I have a guess. I have a sure. Guess. Mel counts. Is that yes? A, yeah. Yes. That was, yeah, that yeah, was awesome. That was awesome. I know that from two K. That's the, that's the <laughs> only reason I know that. <laughs> Mel counts is correct. All right, last one. I. Don't know if I, I think I have heard this name. This is like a guy I was like, I kind of recognize. Uh, yeah, he played for the Celtics tail end of his career. Most known for his time with the Bucks and the Sonics. Give you that. 
when uh, in the 90s? Did I know you say that? Is. Don't say it if you haven't already, but did you say when mid, in the 90s? Mid mid 90s. Yeah. Bucks and Sonics. Mm-hmm. It's not Irvin Johnson. Obviously, I don't mean Magic. There was a center, Irvin Johnson. <laughs> um, Bucks and Sonics. Irvin Johnson was 6'11", by the way, so. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I might have to pull a Sam to pass here because who the Sam, hell do you know is it? this? Is it Jack Sigma? Mm-mm. No, he didn't play for the Celtics, right? Not Jack Sigma. I don't know. Jack Sigma did not, right. in fact, play for the Celtics. No. This guy, what other clue? He also played for the Warriors. Uh, and the Blazers for seven games, if that helps you. Yeah, there have been all star appearance. No. no all star appearances, no awards at all on basketball reference. How many years? Uh, year? 16 years. So he played for so minutes. He was actually like decent. Okay. Um, Let's see. What other clues can I give you? He played at Arizona State, if that helps you out. Uh, he was. At this point, if any of you just yell it out, like, yeah, yeah. So we can he was in a trade for Jack Sigma. If the hell is you all traded by the Bucks with two first round picks to the Sonics for Jack Sigma? So that was his trade. And those first round picks, by the way, one of them turned into Mark Jackson. So uh, then he was traded by the Sonics to the Warriors for a first rounder that turned into Gary Payton. So he was traded for some good players. Um, traded by the Bucks with Todd Day to the Celtics for Sherman Douglas. No, that helps you at all. By the way, Sherman um, Douglas, Syracuse. <laughs> Sherman <out>. Douglas, <laughs> twenty. Do you have a double double or do you have twenty assists? Now? He might have the most assists in a playoff game or something like that. He was he was a Celtics Jeopardy answer. Um, let's see. I think it's an assist know. thing, but I don't really know. So maybe it's the double double. But yeah, you may have to just initials fail. are initials are AL. Alan Lister. A- yes, yeah, I didn't know he know. played on on the Celtics. It's he's Alton, the one that right? got yeah. dunked on by Sean Kemp. There it is, Alton Lister. He well, played the one I think yeah. of when you say dunked on by Sean Kemp is Chris Gatling when Kemp points like this. <laughs> no, that's Lister. I think. I think it's Gatling. I'm gonna pull it up. Dunked on by who? Let me look it up. The shot. He, uh, he for what it's worth, Alton Lister played 110 games with the Celtics, so he just met the criteria. Dunked on by Sean Kemp. Um, here, let me share screen so you guys can tell me what to click. Alton Lister. If you YouTube yeah. it, this one. Yeah, this is Alton uh, Lister. Yes, it was. This is the dunk, and it was Lister. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's Former also Celtic one. May, maybe the Gatling one is when the guy daps up Sean Kemp afterwards. <laughs> yeah, this is the dunk that everyone's thinking of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the point is electric. That's that must be a terrible feeling. Yeah, I'd be furious. Oh, I'd be furious. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but the whole video not having to edit anything and Sam makes me work extra. What a guy. Uh, and the final France. <laughs> Bobby, any final thoughts? No, just uh, shout out Alton Lister. Yes, sir. Shout out Alton Lister. Bobby takes a 3-2 lead in the in the trivia series, Sam. You've got some redemption work to do. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate it. Make sure to subscribe to How About Them Celtics. Check out Bobby's work at SI.com, Inside the Celtics, and I'll let Sam wrap it up. Hey, thank you very much. For watching, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube page, How About Them Celtics. If you do so, you'll get uploads like this one, as well as full-length pods, game recaps, film breakdowns, rumor breakdowns, and our 30-minute pregame streams before each game. Make sure you leave a like, say something nice in the comments, let us know what you thought of the Rockets game, what you think of the Raptors game, and anything else we talked about. You can also find us on streaming platforms like Spotify and Apple. Follow us there. You'll get the audio versions of the full-length pods and the game recaps. Also, leave a five-star review. Jack would appreciate it. And me. You can follow Bobby at Bobby Kravitsky on Twitter. You can find his work on Inside the Celtics for SI Media. He's covering the team. He's on the beep. He's at, beat. He's at the games with Jack. Uh, they're there all the time. So make sure you go read up. 
You can also find us via email, hbtcpod at gmail.com. We read your emails each and every full-length pod, so we love when you guys reach out. We love to hear from you. You can follow us on socials at How About Them C's, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. The Facebook is just the name of the podcast. If you like our Facebook page, our pregame streams will be there as well, despite the Facebook ban. It's over. It's over. You can also find them on Twitter. Jack's Twitter is at Jack's Mon NBA. Mine is at Sam LaFrance NBA. That's it for us. Bye. Chick Taco.